In a helicopter, stability is one of the most difficult characteristics to achieve. There is an inherent tendency in most helicopters to roll or pitch, particularly in gusty air. To combat this tendency, a number of devices have been employed. One of the most successful of these devices is the stabilizer bar. This bar is fastened to the mast just below the rotor in a way which permits it a limited amount of teetering movement. The bar is set at a 90 degree angle to the rotor blades. The controls of the helicopter pass through a mixing lever in the bar before going on to the blades. As the rotor and mast revolve, the stabilizer bar revolves with them. Since the bar is weighted at each end and has no aerodynamic characteristics, it is influenced only by centrifugal force and by its gyroscopic properties. And herein lies the secret of its usefulness. As anyone who has ever spun a top must have observed, a spinning body tends to retain its relative position in space. It strongly resists any effort to change the attitude of its axis or rotation. In other words, spinning bodies possess a property which is common to all gyroscopes, the property known as rigidity in space. No matter how the mount is turned or tilted, the axis of the spinning gyroscope continues to point in the same direction. Since the stabilizer bar is in all important respects a gyroscope, it also possesses the property of rigidity. It is this property which enables it to increase the stability of a helicopter. The stabilizer bar, because of its gyroscopic property of rigidity in space, prevents a temporary disturbance of the rotor from seriously affecting the attitude of the fuselage. Also, it prevents incidental rolling or pitching of the fuselage from being passed on to the rotor. This stabilizing ability of the bar can be better understood, of course, once we know exactly how the bar influences the rotor. The rotor hub is secured to the mast by a universal mount called a gimbal ring. This mount permits the rotor to be independent of the attitude of the fuselage and mast. It is subject only to the controls which come from the swash plate. However, since these controls pass through the stabilizer before continuing on to the rotor blades, the bar is given a limited amount of control over the rotor. This is the way it works. From the swash plate, the push-pull tubes run to the inner ends of the mixing levers, which are housed in the stabilizer bar. The other end of each lever is pivoted to the bar. Then from the center of each mixing lever, pitch change links run to the control point of the pitch change horns, which in turn control the feathering of the main rotor blades. The turning rotor produces the rotor disc. Now if a sudden gust of wind strikes the rotor blades, it may succeed temporarily in altering the attitude of the rotor disc. But any resulting movement of the controls will be absorbed largely by the stabilizer bar as it resists displacement from its normal plane of rotation. The bar will store up the movement and then dissipate it slowly as centrifugal force causes it to return to its normal plane of rotation which is 90 degrees to the mast. Let's look at that again. As the gust forces the rotor disc out of its normal plane of rotation, 
the stabilizer bar exerts its counteraction. By feathering the rotor blades, it increases the angle of incidence on one blade as it decreases the angle of incidence on the other. By this feathering action, the rotor disc is returned to its normal plane of rotation and a balanced condition will again exist. Likewise, if the fuselage for any reason is made to roll or pitch, the stabilizer bar, by retaining its same attitude in space, forces the blades to feather so that they too remain in their same plane of rotation. This prevents the momentary disturbance of the fuselage from being transmitted to the rotor. In a similar manner, any change in the cyclic pitch made by the pilot is modulated by the stabilizer bar before being passed on to the blades. As the rotor disc is tilted and the mass tilts along with it, the stabilizer bar assembly stores up some of the change which the pilot applied and it pays it out slowly as centrifugal force causes the bar to resume its normal position 90 degrees to the mast. The stabilizer bar then tends to slow down or modulate any sudden changes in the rotor disc, whether they are caused by the pilot or by exterior forces. In this way, the bar definitely improves the stability of a helicopter. However, to achieve this stability, a certain amount of the pilot's applied control is delayed. In an H-13 helicopter, only 71% of the control applied by the pilot is transmitted immediately to the rotor, and 29% is stored and then paid out by the stabilizer bar in from 15 to 20 seconds. If nothing were done to compensate for this lag of 15 to 20 seconds, there would be a serious lack of sensitivity in the controls. They would operate like this. The pilot, by changing the cyclic control, would cause the blades to feather. The associated tilting of the rotor disc would result in directional flight. The mast would tilt, but the stabilizer bar would tend to remain in its same plane of rotation, and it would be 15 to 20 seconds before centrifugal force was able to realign the bar in its new position 90 degrees to the mast. Since the bar has delayed 29% of the cyclic control, it would be 15 to 20 seconds before the pilot got a full 100% response to his applied control movement. And the same delay would occur each time the pilot moved the cyclic control. Obviously, the controls would be much too sluggish. In order to speed up the realignment of the stabilizer bar and increase the pilot's effective control, hydraulic dampers are added. The damper assembly is rigidly fastened to the mast just below the bar. It consists of two hydraulic dampers, each connected by an arm and rod to the stabilizer bar frame. The dampers work like this.